We're going to be baptizing, like I said, a family here after the service. We're going to North Mills River. If you need directions, be glad for you to go over there and experience that. It's a, it's a time of celebration as they rededicate and, and recommit. And um, I love a baptism service about as much as I love anything. Because it's representing the old going down and the new coming forth. Amen. Again, I'd like to, everybody that participated in VBS, would you stand please? We'd just like to thank you for your work and your labor. We just bless you. Let's give them a hand. Also, I'd like to thank John and Summer, Jonathan, Chris, uh, Noah, and everybody else. Uh, you can see we're redoing the platform. Doesn't it look good? Amen. So we just got a lot of things happening and uh, getting ready for our fall kickoff, which will be September the 9th. Major changes taking place. I'm not telling anybody, hardly anybody yet, but uh, hopefully within the next week we'll be able to start handing out sheets, telling you what it's going to be so you'll have five weeks to prepare. Amen. Amen. Kingdom living, praying the will of God in the power of God. Praying the will of God in the power of God. What is God's will for my life? There was a poll taken a number of years ago among Christians and non-Christians, and the number one question What am I here for? What am I here for? And the problem in the church is many do not know what they're here for. And God is wanting to say to you today to hear what he's saying to you. To get before him, to seek his face, to pray and say, God, what is your purpose for my life? Yes, it may be working. For those that are married, it's being married. All of those things are there. But God is wanting you to say, God, what is your purpose? What is your destiny? God, what do you want me to step into? And God wants you to pray. I, I'm going into a season of, of study and prayer because I believe with the shifting that's coming place, there is something more that's going to be required of us. I know it is of me, and I believe it is of other people. So how do I pray the will of God in my life? Um, I'm going to read to you the, uh, uh, from 1 John 5, 1 through 15 in the New King James Version, and then I'm going to read the Passion and then I'm just going to kind of talk and preach and do whatever. Amen. Verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him, who begot and also loves him, who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and that his commandments are not burdensome. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That is, he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are many... For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has, not, has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given his son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life, and he who does not have the son does not have life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of God." Now, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. The Passion Translation. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah is God's spiritual child and has been fathered by God himself. Everyone who loves Father God loves his children as well. This is how we can be sure that we love the children of God 
by having a compassionate love for God and by obedience to his commands. True love for God means obeying his commands, and in his commands don't weigh us down as heavy burdens. You see, every child of God overcomes the world, for our faith is the victorious power that triumphs over the world. So we are the world conquerors, defeating his power, those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 6, Jesus is the one who has revealed as God's Son by water baptism and by the blood of the cross. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And the Spirit, who is truth, confirms his testimony so that we have these three constant witnesses given evidence. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are in agreement. If we accept the testimony of men, how much more should we accept the more authoritative testimony of God that he has testified concerning his son. Those who believe in the son of God have the living testimony in their hearts. Those who don't believe have made God out to be a liar by not believing the testimony. God has confirmed about his son. This is the true testimony that God has given us eternal life and this life has its source in his son. Whoever has the son has eternal life. Whoever does not have the son does not have eternal life. I have written this letter to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you will be assured and know without a doubt that you have eternal life. Since we have this confidence, we can also have great boldness before him. For if we present any request agreeable to his will, he will hear us. If we know know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we also know that we have obtained the request we ask of him. There are certain principles that we need to look at when we look at Scripture. We pray for the things that the Bible commands us to pray for. The Bible says that we are to pray for our enemies. Those are the people that use you and abuse you. That may be your boss. It could be your spouse. It could be your children. It could be the guy at the gas station or the guy on the interstate that ran you off the road. The Bible says you are to pray for them and not to give them the California howdy signal. Amen? For those who watch the old Beverly Hillbillies know what I'm talking about. We are to pray that God sends laborers into the harvest. We pray that we do not enter into temptation. We are to pray for the ministers of the word. We are to pray for government authorities. And we are to pray that God will take the affliction from us. And we are to pray for the healing of fellow, fellow believers. When God commands us to pray, we pray with confidence because we're praying according to his will. So the one way that we know the will of God is to know his scriptures, to read his scriptures, and say, God, how do these scriptures apply to me? How am I to step forth in the destiny that you called me to that I may be able to preach or minister your word in the workplace, in my family, in the community in which I'm living? And then we Learn to follow God's will because we look at godly examples in Scripture. Paul prayed for the salvation of Israel. David prayed for mercy and forgiveness. And the early church prayed for boldness. We look at these godly examples in Scriptures. And what I love about Scriptures, they tell the good, the bad, and the ugly. Amen? And do you know that everybody that God used, almost without exception, had a past? <laughs> Did you even know that then when they were following God, they messed up and they sinned major in our eyes and God still used them? Amen. See, all God requires is repentance. All God requires is looking not to the back, but looking forward and saying, God, I failed here. How do I stand in your grace and your mercy and do what you've called me to do? See, when we pray for the will of God, we have to be obedient to what God says to us. You know, and I say this often, we, we pray, say, God, would you just give me a prophetic word? Would you just reveal your will to me? And, and we haven't done the last thing that God said. So why is God going to tell you something else? And, and we've had people come here and they've received the same word for month after month after month. And they say, there's nothing new. And I said, are you doing what you were told to do? Well, no. Well, well, why do you expect God to waste his breath? If you aren't obedient in this thing, why do you think God's going to tell you something else? Amen, Pastor. We see in Scripture that there is a seeking, there is a pursuing, and there is a praying that God's will will be done. 
Gideon, I love Gideon, you know, he's thrashing wheat and, you know, he's hiding from the enemy and the angel of the Lord speaks up to him and, and, and Gideon says, why have these things come upon us? And that's what Christians are saying. Why are these things happening in the world? And, and, and God says to, the angel says to Gideon, get up thy mighty man of valor and go in your strength. See, there's a whole lot more in you than you think there is. There's a whole lot more anointing if you will come into agreement with what the scripture of the Lord is saying to you. When you understand that God calls and God qualifies. It's not you to look down and to say, woe is me and look at my past and this and that and my education and all that. When God calls you, he calls you to step forth. He calls you to step into his purpose and his destiny for your life. You'll never find contentment apart from the will of God. You will never find that place of happiness until you're doing what God called you to do. And it's not always standing behind a pulpit and preaching. God needs people out there more than he needs people here. You're the, you're the change agents. You're the ones that's going to go out and bring the kingdom of God into that workplace. You're the one that's going to bring the kingdom of God into your community, into your family, into your relationship. You're praying for God to do something great, and God is. He's saying, are you going to step forth? Are you going to be a part of the plan that I have for you to redeem the world in which we live? God is looking for men and women, for boys and girls to go forth and to do great things. And then we have to pray with the right motivation and heart. Selfish motives will never be blessed by God. One guy said, God can't be real. I prayed for a million dollars and didn't get it. <laughs> really? For you to even pray for a million dollars so you could buy whatever you want to shows that your motives and your heart's not right. Now, if you say, God, I want you to give me a million dollars and I'm going to give $999,000 for missions, then God may give it to you. But he may want you to give the whole million. Are you going to be willing to do it? See, we pray and we have selfish motives in our heart. We're, we're, we're saying, God, I want this and I want this and I want this. But is it that God receives the glory or that you receive the glory? Is it that you spend it upon your own self? See, when God blesses financially, what often he is testing is how much are you going to bless his kingdom and how much are you going to keep for yourself? This isn't an offering message. This is a principle. It's a kingdom principle that we need to understand that God is looking for hearts that are willing to give. God is looking for people who will pray according to his will. James 4, 3 says, When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. As I've said, and you've seen the many studies, people that win the lottery, <laughs> those precious few out of millions and millions and millions of people that pay their money all the time, they're broke within a year to two years or three years because they've not developed the character to handle what God has given them. And it is the same within the church. Until the character is developed, God's not going to release his greatness in his spirit. He's not going to release his anointing. And, and, and I've been reading some this week, and I had a really amazing conversation with a, a, an apostle out of South Africa. We, went, we were going to meet for an hour. We spent two and a half hours together. And we reconnected and with vision and, and, and what God is saying and what God is doing. But God is looking for a people that will take time and hear what the Father says and then begin to speak it out. He's looking for men and women that will hear his voice first before proclaiming it. We have Pastor Todd here. We have Gary. We, we have other gifted teachers and pastors and anointed. You can give us an outline and we can stand up and preach for 45 minutes or an hour. And not miss a beat, because we've done it year after year after year. Some of you got the gift of gab. <laughs> All you need is a, a verse, and you can get up and you can go. But that is given what you have and not what he has said. And so this has really kind of rocked my boat and, and what he said, because God was speaking to me through some things, and he said, I need you to draw more aside for a season of timing. God says, you know, Greg, I want more of you. And then we have to pray with forgiveness towards others. The spirit of bitterness and revenge and anger only prevents us from doing what God really wants us to do. 
He keeps us from the provision of God, from the mercy of God, from the grace of God. It keeps us from our healing. It doesn't keep us from his mercy and grace. Let me correct it because there's people on Facebook who say he, he, he preached heresy. Nothing can separate us from the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, the righteousness of God. Amen. But our sin can separate us from God. Our attitude can separate us from God. We want to hold our bitterness and our anger because we think in keeping that to ourselves, we have power over the other person. No, they have power over you. They're keeping you from what God has for you. You must. When I'm praying for healing, one of the first questions I ask most of the time is, do you have unforgiveness in your heart? And you will be surprised how many have been in the church for years says yes. <laughs> Well, have you forgiven them? Well, you don't know what they did to me. Well, look what they did to Christ. If they did that to Christ and he forgave them, I think you can forgive what happened to you. Well, I don't like that. I know you don't. So I, I, I lead them in a prayer of repentance. I did it Wednesday night in a parking lot at Ingalls at 10 o'clock. I want to hear God. Do you have unforgiveness? Yes, okay. Well, let's deal with that. And then we pray with thanksgiving. We can always find something to be thankful for. How many of you are glad that you weren't stuck in a cave in total darkness for almost two weeks? <laughs> Lord, i just taken a dive and never come up. <laughs> can you imagine absolute darkness for almost two weeks? Kids, and you've got a coach that's having to try to comfort them, and he's dealing with his own fears. Well, what if we don't get out of this? Well, my life's really tough. Well, it's not that tough. What about the lady that drove, they just found her, she drove off a cliff, and they found her a week later pinned in her car. What about the person that just received word that they have the cancer word, and they said, you've got weeks or months to live? What about the person that walks in, thinks they're getting a promotion, and then all of a sudden they said, no, we're letting you go. We're resizing. And then we look at our problems and we say, God, why is me? And we look around the world and we say, God, I've got it so good. So I'm really trying to hammer this in. The advantage of my traveling and doing missions is the person that has the least in this congregation has 10 times more than anybody does in those poor situations. Todd and they go all the time. We have to refocus people. If we're going to pray God's will, we've got to understand what the will of God is and what God wants to accomplish in us. And I knew this thing was getting possessed because it has a mind of its own. So, you know, think about the small village that has a, an 11 million ton iceberg that's floating towards it in Iceland today. I took this off the news this morning. Can you imagine that? Everything you've got has gone. One man's dying from a flesh-eating disease. This thing's, I, that's why I quit using this big tablet, <laughs> computer. A young woman was kidnapped and molested. But our tendency is to say, God, why me? Then we need to pray with persistence. We pray until we get an answer. We pray in faith, we pray in belief, we pray the word of God. And if you pray for something twice, it is not having any faith. Jesus prayed for somebody twice. Take that to the people that say, if you pray twice, you don't have faith. I haven't seen them raise the dead or feed 5,000 or 4,000. I mean, you know, let's just, let's look at what scripture says. We earnestly pray and pray until God brings the answer. There are people that have been praying 20 and 30 years for something. I'm one of them. My wife has been praying for years. Many of us have been praying for years to see God come. It doesn't mean that God's not listening. It doesn't mean that God has not heard my prayers. It may mean a number of things. It may mean that the timing is not right. It means that a person's heart may be hardened and God's got to do some more to break it. 
which we pray for grace and mercy. And it means that it may not be God's will at all because we don't understand everything that God wants to bring in our life. And then we keep, as I said, we keep praying with that persistence. We keep praying until God answers the prayer or God says, do not pray anymore. We pray and we pray and we pray. We persist until we see the will of God happen. And then we rely on the Spirit of God to pray. Romans 8, 26 and 27 says, We know not what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans and words that cannot be expressed. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in according with God's will. There are some times you don't know what to pray. You ever been there? When everything has come against you and, you know, your emotions are at, at, at the... At, at very uh, rock bottom, and, and you all you can say is, God, you are God. Jesus, I know you love me. I know that you died for me. Will you help me to pray through this situation? And sometimes with this groaning and utterings that we can't understand. You know, in the Pentecostal charismatic, it's praying with the gift of the tongues, with the prayer language in the Holy Spirit. But there's times that we pray and we pray and we just sit there and we weep before the Lord until God brings it to pass. It is a relying on the Spirit of God because, you know, I was praying for my brothers and my family to get saved. And I've told this story often. My brother went on a rafting trip, went down the river, didn't come in. My, my, I got to be careful what I say about my mom, but my mom called me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was in Dallas, Texas. She said, your brother's dead. Now, that's not the phone call you, you want to get. So I got in there. I got on my knees immediately. I was with three roommates. They come in, and I said, God, I, I, I know your destiny and your call for my brother's life. God, you show me, and I believe, God, that you're going to keep him, and, Lord, that he's going to be found, and, God, that he is still alive. And I, I went over, and I, I, I found somebody up at, at that time in the morning, and we lived in a, a, an apartment complex. All of us were Christ for the Nation students, and, and and they prayed with me, and they came in agreement with me. And the next morning, they said, you found your brother. And now he's a Southern Baptist pastor in Clemson, South Carolina. See, we, we, we take what God has said to us, and we, we keep praying it, and we keep praying it, and we keep praying it until we see God bring it to pass. And then we rely on the Spirit of God. And then we understand that, that prayer takes us from being a, away from being a victim to being a victor. There are too many victims in this world. There are too many people that are allowing what has happened to them to determine who they are and how they live their life. And something that happened 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years ago is still controlling their life. And we've got to get beyond that, people, because when Christ forgave us, we are supposed to have forgiven them and that we, as will be practiced this afternoon, as we go under the water and we come out, it's a new life, it's a new day, it's a new purpose. Yeah. The old has passed away and the new has come. And we have to get to that place when we're praying for the will of God that we're willing to let go of all of the stuff of the past, our failures, our mistakes, and all of that so that God can take us and move us forward to what he wants us to do. Ian Bounds said, The gospel of Christ does not move by pauper waves. It has no self-propagating power. It is the power of the people who carry it on in their prayer. Then we have to understand the power of prayer. John 5, 16 through 18 says, The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now let's go back and look at him. <laughs> when Jezebel threatened to kill him, what did he do? Oh God, kill me. He came out of one of the greatest spiritual victories. The prophets of Baal were destroyed. Jezebel, the queen, said, I'm going to kill you. He runs off and he sits there and he whines before the Lord. See, we think that if we walk in great anointing and power and God does great things, that the enemy's not going to come after us. I want to tell you something. 
I've never experienced a great breakthrough that I haven't had the enemy try to come around and get me to focus back on my past or something that came out. Have y'all ever been there? And so we learn to trust in God. We learn to stand in him. And we know what he said. He knows that we know that he loves us, that the plans that he has for us are good and not evil, that he will complete and finish everything that he started for us. We have to know that. We have to know it within the core of our being that God's going to do that. And this thing keeps going back to the scripture, to the front. Lord, what are you saying? <laughs> yeah, I should have bought an apple. I got one. <laughs> So I, I want us to, you know, I'm, I'm going to close in a prayer in just a minute. But how do we pray for the will of God? We know his word. We ask the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and to reveal any sin or any disobedience within us. That's a dangerous prayer. It's a prayer that God will answer immediately. <laughs> Lord, reveal any iniquity in my heart. He goes, there you go. <laughs> What are you going to do with it? It may be a person's face flashes up. It may be a situation or something that happened in the past, something that you did. And I'll tell you something, you'll never step into the will of God until you learn to forgive yourself. Because we've all failed people. And if you haven't, we deal with pride and arrogance, and we can get rid of that spirit for you. Amen? We take care of it. You're no better than anybody else. You have everything you have because of the grace of God and the mercy of God. Yes, you may listen a little bit faster. You may hear the Lord a little bit more clearly. But if you still aren't doing what he calls you to do, you're just the same as the person that's never accepted Jesus Christ. You're in rebellion to the will of God. I know this is hard. But some people keep circling that mountain for a year, up to 60, 70, 80 years. And they don't understand why there's not victory. They don't understand why things don't change. Because they keep allowing the enemy to bring them to that place. I want to give you an illustration that was given to me. I'm going to do it. This is one of the things that I am, God is really beginning to, has been speaking to me and trying to understand it. This is what we will call transformation. It's also called the desert. It's also called the place, um, St. John called it the uh, night, I think it was the night of the cross. Dark night of the soul, there we go. This is where the man of God is made. This is where the woman of God is made. Here, we have salvation. Here, we have um, uh, destiny in part. But what happens is when we go through this process, it is there that we learn our identity and who God is. It is here that we learn that we can do nothing without God. Sometimes, this could be a number of events that will bring this. Could be loss of a marriage. It could be loss of a loved one. Now remember, you have to have the interpretation of my writing, okay? You have to have that spiritual gift. And this could be loss of a job. But what this is, is a crisis point in your life. And in this crisis point, you have to know that God is God, that God is good, and that God is love. And that God has 
his destiny and his purpose on your life. And it is through this desert experience, it is through this um, debar, this place of isolation and desolation that saints, men, and women of God are made. You go through this process, but what you have to understand, when you are here, and you may have received healing, emotional, physical, you may have received deliverance, you could have gone through a number of different things, but what happens is the devil will come from every area that he can to get you what? To deny what? Your identity of who you are in Jesus Christ. When Jesus went in, to the desert, what was the one thing that was attacked consistently was his identity as the Son of God. And that is what the enemy is going to do to you. And you understand why God healed you physically, emotionally. You were delivered and you've, you, you receive this reprieve and this great enlightenment and this empowerment and this vision of God. And then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. And you can't point to sin, you can't point to rebellion, you can't point to anything else. But all of a sudden, the enemy comes with such might and power, you begin to doubt if you're even saved because the devil came to destroy your identity and your testimony in him. And it is in this process that we learn that who we are in Christ and we may operate without a level of power and anointing because God You have to know, as God calls you forth, that he is God and you are not. That he has called you, that he will sustain you, and he will keep you. But if you run by your emotions and by your feelings and let all this doubt and unbelief come in that the devil and other people will push at you, then you're going to go back to this point. And then God is going to allow, he doesn't bring it, he's going to allow another event to come. Because what he wants you to do is come from this place of transformation, this place of difficulty, this desert experience, and you will know without a shadow of a doubt that God loves you, that his plans for you are good and not evil, and everything around you is saying different, but you know in whom you have believed. Amen? So when you go beyond this place here and you come into here, it is new levels, new angels. New levels, new call. It is a new sense of destiny and birthing of what God has brought you into because it is at this place that your character has been defined or redefined. Your character has been strengthened. Your calling has been undergirded. That God is speaking and you are listening to what he's saying and you don't care what he says, you do it. You don't whine, you don't complain. You don't say, why me, God? You don't do any of that. You say, yes, Lord, I know that you love me. I know that you will sustain me. I know that you will keep me. I know that you will empower me to do anything that you call me to do. It is at this place that the world has changed. It is at this place that Christian mighty men and women of God are born. It is this place where we move out of the temporal life and we say, God, I want to do that for eternally what you have called me to do. I want to bring your kingdom to the world in which I live. See, this is where God is wanting everybody to come, but too many people live out of their emotions. Too many people live out of their failures. Too many people live out of all of the stuff that's happened to them, and they don't understand that God has called them to be mighty men and women of God. He says to the Gideons in this sanctuary and the Gideons that are listening on Facebook, he is saying to you today, rise up, mighty man and woman of valor, and go in the strength that is in you because the Holy Spirit resides in you. It is this that God has called us to do, that we walk in the power and the authority that God's given us, and all of this stuff is stuff. It doesn't affect my destiny, and it may affect my destiny if I don't obey it, but I'm going to heaven. But I I don't want fire insurance. I want to get to heaven. And God says, well done. It took you a while to understand it, but man, them last years were good ones. I'm determined to go out wide open, burning for the Lord. I've had 61 years of sitting on my duff. Not really, but... I'm determined that my end year is going to be radical. 
I tell my wife that all the time. I want more radical. I want more crazy for God. Because I want to change the world in which I live. I've had all of this stuff, and this stuff's going to come. I'm not saying that I'm through it. But I've, I've been through it, and I'm here, and I just want to make sure that I don't start listening to all the naysayers and all the people. Because God's calling us for something far greater than we've ever experienced. God is calling us to step into a future that's going to change the world in which you live today. You can have, you know, you can have itch and ears and go hear what you want to hear. But this is the message that's changing the world. It's not five points to have a better marriage. <laughs> I, I know I'm going to say this. Get your heart circumcised and you'll have a better marriage. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I love healing rooms. I love Zozo. I love cleansing stream. I love RTF. I, I love uh, John and Paulus. I love all of that. And, and I believe in all of that ministry. But if we really know who we are in Jesus Christ and we really die out the self and we really get a circumcision in the heart, we won't have to have all that stuff. But I hate to tell you, there's a lot of you that need it. Because you've not realized who you are in Christ and who Christ is in you. And that's okay. We're here to help one another become everything that God's called us to be. And so that is, that is what God is calling us to do, is how are we going to change the world? How are we going to change this region? I'm not satisfied that Asheville has the reputation that it has. I want Asheville to be known in one place. It's a place of transformation. It's a place of the presence and the glory and the healing of God. There's been prophetic words of that in there, Todd. And I'm believing God for that. I don't care what the newspapers, I don't care how many bumper stickers say, keep it weird. We need to get it and say, make it holy, Lord. <laughs> well, you are not to talk like it. Why not? That's how God talks. He spoke and it happened. Jesus heard. He spoke and it happened. Jesus was fully God, fully man, just like you and I. He was God. He was without sin. Hear what I'm saying. Theologically, hear what I'm saying. But he had to depend upon the Father to hear the Father's world. And when he spoke it, it came to pass. He was demonstrating our life in him. He divested himself of all of his power and all of his glory. He spent time with the Father praying and hearing and listening. And when he spoke, he spoke what the Father had revealed. That's what Scripture says. He only did what the Father showed him. Amen. The problem with us, we hear something and we've not been able to distinguish whether it's the Holy Spirit or another spirit. Because we've still got so much stuff in our life that we're hearing all of the other voices. We've not died out to self and we've not let God do what he wants to do in our life. God requires one thing of you and one thing only, and that's your death. <laughs> well, I don't believe that. Just read the scripture. Oh, Lord. I was hoping I wouldn't have this thing up here today. It's the church of all about me. That's the church today. Amen. In a lot of places in the world, it's all about me. It's about my preference. It's about my likes. It's, it, it, it's nostalgic when I remember back to the good old days. And, and most people, they, they weren't really that good. What has God said to you? If you know that and you aren't doing it, you're in sin. I'm trying to tell you how to pray the will of God. 
You can pray and quote scripture all you want to, but until you put your feet in obedience behind what God's spoken, you aren't going to see what God's called you to do. You can say anything you want to. Well, you know, oh, Lord, help me. God has enough people navel gazing. He needs doers. There's enough people looking inward and saying, and God said, no, get yourself, get your eyes off of yourself and start looking outward. Be who I called you to be. Share what I've told you to share. Do everything that I've called you to do. My parents got so mad at me, eventually my wife said to me, you need to go get a, you need to get into the ministry because I wanted to get a doctorate. I was content studying and reading and having Carol support most of my lifestyle. Because <laughs> I was doing the work of the Lord. I was preparing myself. <laughs> no, I was doing everything I could to keep out from doing what God called me to do. Y'all know it's true. Well, I need one more course on witnessing before I share. No, you don't. Just go out and tell Jesus. Well, I need to get a Bible education before I can teach a Sunday school class. No, you don't. Just love people and, and share what God gives you. <laughs> this whole Greek mindset's really got the American church just and, and the European church just jacked out. It's not about here. It's here. It's here. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the depth of our spirit, God speaks. God brings forth his word out of the depths of our spirit. We must understand that God has called us for such a time as this. What is the will of God? That is between you and the Lord. But don't ask God what his will is if you aren't willing to obey it. Because all you're going to do is bring hardship upon yourself. I'm just, I'm telling you, I, I've read this and I've walked through it. God, what's your will for me? Well, you haven't done what I asked you to do the last time, Bubba. Well, I need somebody to lay hands on me. Well, maybe, but maybe you just need to get the Holy Ghost to have lay hands on you. I'm, I'm not, a, I, you know, I believe in, in, in laying on hands and, and, and being anointed. I believe in all of that. But there comes a time when we got to quit looking to other people and start being what God called me to be. We, we go to church or we go to a conference and, and we just, we've had the Gehenna beat out of us and we go there and we're saying, I've got to have a touch from the Lord. I've been there so many times and finally I can go to a conference now and say, God, do whatever you want to do. I'm in a good place. Why am I in a good place? Because it's not about me. It's not about me. Nothing I do is about me. Well, there has to be something. Just get over yourself. We allow God to do what he wants to do. Aren't you glad the power went out and gave me time to get fired up? I noticed this fan here, and I'm going, that fan's out of place. It's not even working. It's not plugged up. That's like the church. It's just not plugged up. <laughs> it's supposed to bring a refreshing, and it's not. <laughs> Woo! Prophetic sign. <laughs> it's just out of place. And that's where the church is today. It's just out of the place where God wants it. Amen. Y'all ready to pray? Come on, let's stand. Hands up. 
Repent after me. Heavenly Father, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about me. It's about your glory, your honor. Jesus Christ, I submit to your lordship. I ask you to do a new work in my heart. And I ask you, Holy Spirit of truth and revelation, that you would show me every place that I am disobedient. And I ask you for your grace and strength to help me to die to self so I can live for your glory. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Hallelujah.